Hi guys, welcome. Uh, today we're looking at oxygen. So, specifically oxygen in a koi pond environment, but everything I do say and talk about does apply to any, any pond really containing fish, uh, not just a koi pond. So, firstly I'm going to go through what in the, why we need oxygen in the pond in the first place, what in there needs oxygen and, and how it uses it, why, what it uses it for. We'll look at ways of, of introducing oxygen into your water. We'll talk about the levels that you should be aiming to achieve, what levels are dangerous, uh, what levels are, are okay and what levels will enable your fish, your koi to, thr to thrive and flourish. We'll look at how you test oxygen, uh, the oxygen levels in your pond and I'll go, go through very quickly a, a test with you to determine the dissolved oxygen level in your pond water. And then lastly, I'll go through um, some questions and answers. So I, I asked on the, on the channel community tab, I asked for people's, uh, any questions that people have specifically they'd like me to answer. So we'll go through those at the end. As always, if this is my first video you've seen, do check out the, uh, the channel and have a look at the other videos on there. There's, there's a lot of videos now covering a lot of topics from, you know, nitrites, ammonia, nitrates, um, showers, filters, all kinds of stuff on the feeding. Um, do, do have a look and we'll crack on with the oxygen. As I'm sure you know, oxygen is essential for life, to maintain life. Now the air around us that we breathe contains about 21% oxygen, um, the rest mostly nitrogen, but about 21% oxygen. And in the koi pond environment, the, the things that use oxygen, obviously, your koi, your fish themselves, um, respiratory system, they, they use oxygen uh, to, to live. Also, bacteria, so biofilms in your bi biological filters, those bacteria all need oxygen to live. But also, and more importantly, the, the process that they uh, facilitate, so it can converting the ammonia in your pond into nitrate uh, and then the nitrate into nitrate. Those processes of conversion all require oxygen and all consume oxygen, uh, quite, quite big volumes of oxygen as well. So as well as, as, well as just, just surviving, the, the process that they undertake also uses up a lot of oxygen. Uh, algae, weeds, uh, plants, generally during the day when the sun's up, photosynthesis is occurring, they, they tend to produce small levels of oxygen. But at night when the sun goes in uh, and there's no photosynthesis possible, they actually then consume oxygen. So they will cause fluctuations in the dissolved oxygen levels in your pond water. So something worth, worth noting when you come to measure the pond um, oxygen. It would be different, for example, for, for, as the sun comes up first thing in the morning to last thing at night as the sun goes down. And lastly, rotting and decomposing material. So if you've got leaves, detritus, sludge at the bottom of your pond or anywhere in your system, um, that, that process of decomposition will also use oxygen up. As I think everyone's aware, a, a, a body of water is capable of, of holding an amount of oxygen. And the, the maximum amount of oxygen that that water can hold is the saturation point. So basically the saturation point is the maximum uh, figure, the maximum capacity for holding oxygen that that water has, usually measured in milligrams per litre. And, and as I say, the saturation point, it's the point at which that water cannot possibly physically hold any more oxygen. So if you think of it like a bucket, for example, and you're dropping marbles in and the marbles represent the oxygen, you can, you can drop the, the marbles in, you can continue dropping them in and you'll get to a point where the bucket's full and you carry on dropping the marbles and they'll simply won't fit in anymore. Um, and that point is the saturation point. Now, the, the saturation point of water isn't fixed, it changes with various, various things. Um, so effectively the size of the bucket can vary. Uh, now one thing is pressure, atmospheric pressure, stormy thundery weather for example, particularly hot and humid weather. Altitude is another one, very high altitudes, less oxygen. They're all though related to pressure. Now the pressure 
as a bearing, as I say, on how much oxygen water can hold, but it is a very small bearing. It, it's, I wouldn't say it's insignificant, but for the purposes of a koi pond, you can largely ignore those influences. Uh, the main one, the, 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 the biggie, if you like, is temperature. So the temperature of the water has a big influence on how much oxygen that water is capable of holding. Now I'll put those figures up on the screen um, and, and they'll, be, they'll be up again at various times as we go through so you can keep referring to them but just quickly I'll read through them now and I am reading for this to be honest with you because I don't want to get it wrong so um, at, at a temperature of zero degrees your water is capable of holding 14.6 milligrams per litre of oxygen at a temperature of five degrees your water is now capable of holding 12.8 milligrams per litre of oxygen. 10 degrees, 11.3 milligrams per litre of oxygen. At 15 degrees, it's 10.1 milligrams per litre of oxygen. At 20 degrees, and apologies, this is degrees C. Um, at at uh, 20 degrees, it is 9.1 milligrams per litre of oxygen. 25 degrees is 8.2 milligrams per litre of oxygen and for those who are lucky enough to reach these kind of levels at 30 degrees your water can hold 7.5 milligrams per litre of oxygen. So you can see um, quite a big variation based on temperature but worth noting the thing to take from this is that is all that is is the maximum amount of oxygen that your water can physically hold so the saturation point and the range as you say at 0 degrees 14.6 milligrams per litre and at 30 degrees it's 7.5 milligrams per litre so half um, so quite quite a big impact uh, now I'll quickly just touch on what kind of levels koi and, and all fish are the same um, need to survive basically survival it, about three milligrams per litre you get down to three milligrams per litre and your koi will die um, up, a, up to five milligrams per litre they'll live maybe weeks months maybe even but they are in danger at, at five milligrams per litre uh, so so six milligrams per litre really is is the minimum you want to be at for survival seven milligrams per litre is better than six and eight is better than seven etc etc i want to be up at nine eight or nine at least milligrams per litre of oxygen all the time and that kind of level you can thrive they're not surviving they're thriving and oxygen the the, the oxygen level will have a big impact on on things like how active you are the exercise that they're getting the energy they've got their appetites is the biggest uh, you know the big one just the whole well-being, um, the more oxygen in the water, the better. And before we move on, just before we move on from saturation, I just want to kind of make the point really, a lot of people think they need to add more oxygen because the water's warmer, um, because it holds less, but actually the water, whatever level you're putting in, that doesn't really change when the temperature changes what what changes is the maximum amount of oxygen that the water can hold so if you're putting in in the in the winter when it's 10 degrees if you're putting in enough oxygen to give you six milligrams per liter then you you know you can see from what we said earlier even at 30 degrees your water is capable of holding six milligrams per liter so that increased temperature it doesn't mean you need to put more oxygen in necessarily it just means that the water can hold less but the amount that it can hold is still more than enough for you for your fish to flourish just a little caveat to that what does change is during the summer months the water is warmer yes but during the summer months you're feeding your koi more um, so your biofilm is, is, is active, your fish are active, all those things are using more oxygen. So the amount that you put in in the winter to get six milligrams per litre isn't necessarily the same as, you know, if you put the same amount in in the summer, you, you will have less than six milligrams per litre because all those organisms are now using more oxygen. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I hope I've explained that. But 
so it's just something worth keeping in mind so I, if you've watched any of my other videos you'll know I am a massive advocate of oxygen and getting as much in as you possibly can it contributes to so many things so you know you've got um, as I've said increased appetite you've got increased well-being vigor um, the more active the, the just so much happier get you know the more oxygen you put in also you've other benefits as well to put in a lot of air into your pond um, so you can see behind me my bottom drain running there another benefit to that is that you can see the bubbles break on the surface the surface of the pond is is totally disrupted um, so that also stops predators from being able to see into your pond and see your koi um, so again another benefit also particularly with a, an aerated bottom drain like this one the circulation that it creates and the water movement helps to keep the bottom clean it, it's that movement make, means all the muck and the waste finds its way into the bottom drain very quickly and the bottom of the pond is kept clean um, so there's many many benefits it, it, it also stops the water freezing over in the winter if you can keep that movement so lots of benefits as well as those immediately obvious to, to adding as much uh, as you possibly can to your pond something I see asked quite regularly is if is can you put too much air in um, and the answer to that is no and yes <laughs> um, in a koi pond realistically no you can't possibly put too much air in there is a condition however called gas bubble disease which which is a result of of there being too much oxygen in water but as I say under normal koi pond conditions you're not going to achieve that it, it's basically super saturation so effectively the only way you're going to do it is if you use very highly compressed air and you force that compressed air still under pressure into the pond and then those bubbles of compressed air are able to find their way into your koi or into your um, fish's bloodstream and then they cause gas bubble disease but realistically you're not going to be able to do that you can't do it for example with a normal koi pond pump or, or anything like that you would have to use compressed air or compressed oxygen you'd have to you know purposely force it into the water it's not going to happen so effectively what you're doing there is you're squeezing those marbles that we talked about earlier you're crushing the marbles so much that you're making the marbles smaller so that you can actually get a few more in your bucket but in real terms it's not going to happen so get that air in uh, in terms of testing i will um i use there's a couple of there's a few actually but the the, the jbl kit um, is the one i tend to use for testing oxygen it, it's a normal dropper test kit like any other tetra do one as well that's quite common about eight or nine quid the tetra one jbl one's a bit dear about 14 either either kit works perfectly well and i'm sure there's others as well uh, i test mine it's a good it's good practice to test it in the height of summer if you do it in the summer when your filters fully active your fish are being fed the water's at its warmest if your system is introducing enough oxygen then to be you know seven eight nine milligrams per litre in the summer in those conditions then you know for a fact that in the the rest of the year the same equipment is going to only give you higher oxygen so you don't need to measure it all the time once you know that the equipment you've got running um, is, is giving you a good level at that at that you know main time at the time when it's been used uh, at the highest rate so yeah once you once you establish that then you're okay the only times you need to test then really i mean it's good practice to check it occasionally but if you change something that may impact the oxygen so for example uh, if you change an earth stone because um, not all earth stones are equal uh, you'll see behind me the, the transfer of, of oxygen from air uh, into water is, is heavily reliant on surface area so one earth stone producing tiny little bubbles could have 10 times the that surface area contact than another earth stone producing bigger bubbles so they're not all equal so if you change an earth stone you change an air disc um, that could impact how much oxygen transfer you're getting uh, if you change a filter if you get a new air pump anything at all that, that's changing that setup that you have running then you you might want to test again uh, just to make sure 
oh sorry and adding more fish is another one you know people had several fish he kind of sneaks up on us all doesn't it you know you get one here and one there and before you know it you're massively overstocked so adding extra fish increases the load on the uh, oxygen supply so again um, if you put more fish in give it a week or two to, to reach an equilibrium and then test again just to make sure uh, starting a new filter is another one you know if you change your filter over you may end up you may go to more a, a much bigger biological um, biofilm uh, which will consume a lot more oxygen so again you might want to retest your oxygen after that uh, pond treatments as well if you have to treat your pond for any reason quite a lot of the treatments the chemicals used um, PP for example is a big one or whatever it may be um, just make sure uh, you still have enough oxygen going in once the treatment's gone in you may be that you have a spur air pump and you add that whilst treating but yeah it's worth just bear in mind that treatments that you have that you put in there will will have a, a bearing on the oxygen load the oxygen demand so first thing is take the little sample bottle clean it through in pond water very thoroughly and then with this kit you need to fill it right to the brim so right up to the top it's not like other kits where you have a, a line you actually brim this right up um, then the first one the oxygen test reagent number one six drops and you'll notice this is already full so it is very strange this how it works So six drops of the first one, then straight away, oops, wrong one, without doing anything else, six drops of the second one, and you'll see this does spill out. sometimes well the uh, surface tensions kept it all in it does sometimes spill out and that is okay then put the lid on the test kit dictates that you put the lid on without causing any air bubbles now I have absolutely no idea how you do that shake for 30 seconds okay lid off again And then the third one, number three, again, six drops. And again, it, it's very slow. You need to add the drops very slowly with these kits because they kind of, because you're up full with a full container, they can spill out. So, one, two. Six. I'll lid back on and then again on with the lid it doesn't matter this time if you trap her but as I say I have absolutely no idea how you do it without so another 60 seconds of vigorous shaking okay so that's the that's the bottle with everything done we just need to wait 10 minutes okay guys so you can see that's the chart there unfortunately they only go up to 10 these now this water is about six a bit over six degrees so this water is capable of holding around 12 milligrams per litre so off the chart but if you compare it, it kind of starts yellow and it goes through orange and becomes more red um, they're not the easiest things to see if I'm honest but you can see from this m mine is 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 more red than the 10 so all i really can take from this is that i'm above 10 which is which is fine you know um six uh six is a safe level seven eight it's all a bonus but yeah they're, they're not the easiest things to see when you're at the lower figures you can see them quite clearly but when you're up at the top end it does become a little vague 
Um, I'm not sure how you can see that, but yeah, what we're taking from this is this is this pond's just under a thousand gallons. I have a 70 litre air pump um, pumping through a spin drifter bottom drain, and I have the um, filter return as well, creating oxygen. So I'm really banging the oxygen in. I'm I would guess at this time of year I'm probably up around 11 milligrams per litre, um, probably 90% saturation, which is a good figure to be at. But the point point is that this is not too much. You know, this is how much air I've got in a tiny pond, and it's not too much. If you need to get more oxygen in, I would always advocate having a spare air pump. The pumps fail. You know, it's a fact. Things break. Get yourself a spare pump, stick it in the garage just in case, and then if you have a, a problem, you can put that on. If you are really desperate, um, a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution, which you can get from the chemist, spray that over the top of the water. That will, will give you a big shot of oxygen, temporary short term, while you, while you, you source a new, um, a new air pump or whatever. Okay, so we'll, I'll move on to the, uh, the questions. So I've got, I've got four here that um, I'm going to go through now and, and, and I'll answer in turn. The first one is, if you have a moving bed, and a backy shower. Uh, do you still need to pump air into the pond via an air stone, etc.? And and the worry is that people have quite to look at, and uh, you keep on them in a jacuzzi. Uh, it's difficult to see them. And the, the, there is no real short answer to this, I guess, other than to to test. It could be that you're getting enough oxygen. It all depends on the many factors that I've talked about. Uh, you know, the number of fish you've got, the biological load, etc. It could be that you're getting enough oxygen from a shower, which does add a lot of air, uh, a lot of oxygen, and a moving bed. And then the next pond along, which has a higher biological load, more fish, uh, feeds a different food, is heated, whatever, it could be totally different. Um, so there's no real easy black and white answer to this, to be honest. It sounds like a bit of a cop out, but you really need to test it. Um, just get yourself a kit and test it, um, would be my advice on that one. Next question is, hi, most hobbyists will have no way of measuring the oxygen in their pond. This being said, can you give guidance? Maybe using a 10 ton pond as an example, uh, as to how many litres of air per minute and what size pump you should be using. The answer is yes and no. Yes, uh, uh, you can calculate that, but and it's a big but. The calculation is complicated and it is massively difficult to get it accurate. Um, if you remember I talked about the surface area, the bubbles, you know, um, it's hugely dependent on the contact area between the air and the water as those bubbles are rising. And, and one air, even just one air stone to the next, it gives a totally different surface area. So calculating it is an absolute minefield. Somebody could put 40 litres into a pond and, and have more than enough dissolved oxygen. Everything else being the same, somebody else could put 40 litres in, but through a different earth, earth stone, and, and there may not be enough. It, it, it's an absolute minefield, to be honest. Um, so yes, you can do it. And, and another thing, sorry, I didn't mention is air pumps. Um, I had a, for, a Meadow 40 some years ago, which is a good quality air pump, and, and an expensive pump, if I'm honest, a diaphragm pump, 40 litre air pump. I ran two bottom drains from that pump at six foot down and they absolutely pumped out air. Um, my spur pump at the time was a 120 litre uh, high blow uh, piston pump off eBay, cheap as chips. And you think, well, it's 120 litres. It's three times as powerful as the Meadow 40. So it, it must do the job, you know. Um, kept that in the shed as a spur. And I, I actually tried that one day, I put it on and it, nothing came out of those drains. I switched to one drain, I ran that pump to one drain and I got a trickle of air out. Um, all pumps, what I'm saying, all pumps are not made equal. Um, you get what you pay for it largely with air pumps. One, one manufacturer's 40 litre air pump will give you double the flow of the next manufacturer's 80 litre air pump and, and that is no exaggeration. The figures that they come up with, uh, sometimes I think they dream them up, but I think they, they measure them at, at, with zero head pressure, zero back pressure on, um, but the quality of the pump dictates how much that flow suffers when you apply head pressure, back pressure to it. 
Um, the Meadow Forty obviously was a, was able to continue pumping good volumes of earth even with the back pressure on it. The high blow just gave up a little bit of back pressure and it gave up. So I'm rambling, but you can. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, point from this though is, and you're not alone in this. Um, most hobbyists will have no way of measuring the oxygenation in the pond. I see that all the time. Uh, people. People don't seem to realise that you can just buy a test kit for oxygen and measure the oxygen levels. It seems to be a bit of a myth that oxygen is something you can't measure, but it's just as easy as any other parameter in the in the pond to measure. So the answer basically uh, is get yourself a test kit, measure your oxygen levels, and you will know. Um, add more if necessary. You know, there's no other way around it. To be honest, calculating it's just not a viable option. Okay, do you think earth should be added to the pond in winter? Uh, some say yes, some say no. What are your thoughts? Absolutely yes. I've never in 24 or 5 years of keeping koi turned anything off in the winter. Uh, on pump filters, UV, everything stays on. Nothing needs to come off in the winter. Uh, a pond system, you, you create an little ecosystem. It's all about consistency, equilibrium, balance. You don't want to do anything to disrupt that. As I said, it'll stop your pond freezing. It keeps that movement, keeps your fish active um, when others are sat on the bottom. Um, absolutely keep everything running. And lastly, how much oxygen gets used up in a filter? Again, there are millions, if not billions, of bacteria living in a biological filter. I'm sure someone somewhere is clever enough to be able to calculate that. I haven't been able to find figures easily that I could rely on to be honest other than to say uh, it's a lot uh, would be is the answer it's surprisingly large amounts so as I said to you the bacteria they need her to live uh, sorry oxygen to live to survive but then the process of the denitrifying process turning ammonia to nitrate to nitrate uses a lot of oxygen to 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 um to do that and 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 as such a biological filter uses a lot of oxygen uh, is all and again i know that's very vague but it, it's not to be underestimated essentially um i've gone on a long time uh, which i didn't intend hope at least somebody's still with me and not fell asleep or give up um hope that was of some use to you the underlying thing I'd like you to take from this is that you just can't have too much and get get that her in there get it in yes i appreciate it can affect your um viewing but i have a little uh a switch at the side of the pond there if i want to view the fish turn it off it, it's that simple it, it, it's more important that it's on um 24 7 than you're able to you know to see the fish so as always thank you for watching if you got this far uh, please do check out the channel have a look at the rest of the videos if you like the video do, do give me a like um, please leave a comment good or bad um, and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel thank you